Victory Gardens were a product of war when resources were scarce and there was a massive shift in production to feed the war machine. Governments everywhere were encouraging their citizens to dig for victory, and that's exactly what they did. They grew their gardens and they preserved their food for the winter because they needed to supplement their meager rations. Today's Victory Garden is about self-sufficiency. It is about building and strengthening a skill that we might desperately need if food prices continue to go up and if we encounter a food shortage. Hopefully we won't need this skill, but I think it is better to learn how to garden and to keep a garden than to not have the skill at all. Having a victory garden is empowering. Not only does it hook us up with fresh organic produce, but it also connects us to our ancestral roots. It connects us to the earth and to our food. And it's one of the best ways to vote with your dollar against industrial agricultural practices, which are killing the living soil. And if you didn't know this, the soil is very much alive and conventional farming practices with their pesticides and their herbicides and their fungicides and their monoculture crops, they're killing the soil. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing my own journey as a victory gardener as I prepare and plan for the upcoming growing season in zone 5A. I will be sharing some of the things I've been learning in this current off season what I am up against in my garden, how I am planning to work with what I have this year. And at the very end, we're going to be starting some seedlings together because growing your own seedlings is one of the best ways to save money as a gardener. And it flexes that self-sufficiency muscle. I began my victory garden journey in 2019, a few months after I moved into my home. I started out with a small herb garden, a couple of garden beds, and a tiny vegetable patch. Since 2019, we've expanded the garden a bit. So that tiny vegetable patch, we turned into a large garden bed. The following year, we converted some of our front lawn to include a medium-sized garden bed. My husband also dug me a small medicinal bed to help me fill up my old-fashioned apothecary, which I use to make salves, syrups, tinctures, and teas. With all of the expansion that we did, one of the things that we invested in was a small rototiller just to help us break up the soil and to clear out some weeds. And there's this saying which you may or may not be familiar with, and it is, you don't know what you don't know. We have used the rototiller for two years in a row now, and this is the first year where we're not going to use it. In fact, I'm probably just going to sell the rototiller because I had no idea how damaging it was to the soil. One thing I love about freshly tilled soil is just how fluffy it is and how beautiful it is to work with when it's nice and fresh. But this year, I learned something about tilling. Now, my points of reference for what I'm about to cover come from two sources. One is the book Fantastic Fungi by the esteemed mycologist, well, it was edited by this esteemed mycologist, Paul Stamets. It's a fantastic read. I highly recommend it. I'll link it below. The other book that covers it extensively is Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway. I am still working through this book. It is full of rich information about permaculture. It is massively changing how I think about gardening and how I will be gardening in the future. So yes, when you till soil, it's nice and fluffy, it seems to clear weeds, but what we don't see happening are the long-term consequences. So while it clears out those pesky weeds that we don't want to have in our garden, it actually digs up dormant seeds that have been lying there waiting and they would probably just, you know, never come up. But you bring those seeds up and then they blossom and then you have more weeds in your garden than you did before. Another thing that it does is rev up the metabolism of the microbes that are living in the soil. So... With these rubbed up metabolisms, they get really hungry and they burn up nutrients like crazy. And these are nutrients that your plants need. Normally, microbes work symbiotically with your plants. They feed each other. Another thing that may happen is that tilling may hard pan the soil over time, which means it makes it less absorbent. Um, it's just you have hard earth that you need to dig through and it's not fun to work with. And that's something... I really started to notice in my garden is that after a heavy rain, like my soil would kind of get crusty. So that's one practice I'm going to be doing away with is tilling my soil. 
Another thing that I have been learning more about this year from Gaia's Garden is the importance of mulches. So in the last couple of years, I've been using straw to mulch. Before that, when I first started my journey, I didn't mulch at all because my mom didn't mulch and I just didn't learn about the importance of mulch. So this mulch that I've been using is straw, which feeds carbon to my soil, but it's not very nitrogen rich. And that's where Guy's Garden has kind of been helping me to fill in the gaps because there are living mulches that will help feed nitrogen to your soil. For example, white clover is a really good one. There's an anecdote in the book about this man who covered his garden paths with white clover. Uh, and I think that's genius. I've always kept my garden paths bare. And one thing that I've never really thought much about before that this book really provoked um, and to thought was this idea that nature hates bare soil. If nature sees bare soil, she just wants to send weeds up. Like it's unnatural to have a naked patch of soil. Another thing that is unnatural when we garden are these rows of the same plant. It basically sends a message to all the insects that, hey, there's a buffet here, come and eat. So those are a couple of things I'm trying to uh, move away from. So I think this year I'm really considering covering my garden paths with white clover because white clover feeds nitrogen down and it also attracts pollinators. I had already been introduced to this idea of living mulches. So for the last couple of years, I've kind of let some of my ground cover weeds grow. So purslane, for example, is an edible weed. I eat it and I also kind of left it to grow in my garden just because it helped to um, shade my plants a little bit and it helped to cover the soil to help retain the moisture. Another one that I purposely grew were nasturtiums, which are an edible flower. Every year has its lessons. Every year I garden a little bit differently. And I think with this year's off-season research, it's really going to change up the way I garden because I want to move away from the traditional slash conventional ways of gardening and garden in such a way that I'm embracing and I'm working with nature as opposed to against nature. And while I'm all for tradition, I think leaning into this world of permaculture is a better way to lean into our ancestral history because there's nothing new. Like There were cultures that worked with the forest to grow their gardens and we can do the same. Now, before I get into what I'm up against in my garden, I just want to add, if you like this video so far, please give it a quick thumbs up. It really helps a small channel like mine to go a long way. There are some things in my garden that I've been battling with for the past three years that uh, make it a little bit challenging for me to effectively grow my crops the way they should grow. Squirrels love my garden and they're especially pesky in the spring when they're looking for food. So they're digging through my freshly sown beds and looking for nuts or whatever they may have buried. Or maybe they're just eating my shoots or looking for bugs. They're a little bit of a nuisance and I could probably work better with them. And that's the thing about permaculture is because you want to work together. You want to build an ecosystem in your garden. Another thing that I'm up against are Japanese beetles. They go around and they eat my leaves. They especially love my bean leaves. They love my grape leaves. They love my raspberry bushes. I spend many days in the summer just walking around with a soapy bucket of water and manually pick off these beetles um, to clear them of my garden. But they always keep coming back. And I think the best way to go against them is to invite helpful predators in my garden that can feed off of these Japanese beetles, which means I need to create a better environment. Another pest that I'm up against is the squash vine borer. Last summer, I had a friend over for a play date and we were walking around my garden and she saw my zucchini plant, which was all shriveled and desiccated and sad. And she's like, oh, I see you got hit by the squash vine borer. I'm like, what is this? So I actually learned more about it in this book, Companion Planting for Beginners by Brian Lowell. This is an excellent book and I'm going to be leaning heavily on this when I plan my garden this year. So what a squash vine borer does in the spring, it just hovers around, it finds the perfect plant for it to lay its eggs. And when those eggs hatch, the larvae basically burrow themselves into your plant and they eat, 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 and they kill the plant. So the best way, according to Lowell, to fight against the squash vine borer is to install floating row covers when the plants are still young to prevent the squash vine borer to swoop down and lay their brood. And then after 
that period of time has passed, you foil up the base of the plant. I think that's what he says. Yeah, once the covers are removed, wrap aluminum foil around the stem to place another physical barrier between the stem and the moth. Be sure to wrap the stem up to the first leaves and then bury the bottom of the foil below the surface. Planting sweet alyssum, dill, and fennel and letting them flower will attract parasitic wasps which will lay their eggs inside the eggs of squash fine borers, stopping the problem before the borers even hatch. This book is full of tips for the best plants to plant in order to attract different pollinators and those parasitic wasps that help kill off the big bad bugs in the garden. Another thing I'm up against are cutworms. These tiny little bugs, they like coming in and they just cut down whatever it is I'm growing, whether it is my young bean plants or other shoots. They just chop it off. And what I'm going to do this year, I'm going to try putting little rolls of toilet paper. I've been amassing a collection of them to protect my young crops. And I'm just going to kind of use that as a collar until they have established themselves. Another thing I'm up against are mineral deficiencies, and that usually comes across as discolored leaves. I need to do a better job of keeping up the nutritional level of my soil, and I really believe that companion planting along with the living mulches and regular fertilizing will help. And that's the thing with permaculture is that you shouldn't have to rely on fertilizer once you've really let nature work alongside you. We've kind of built up this reliance on fertilizers just because we're combating against nature. Companion planting is going to be huge this year. I am planning to rely heavily on it. I'm going to be planting my crops in different groups. Like I'm not just going to have a row of peppers. I think I'm still going to keep my tomatoes all in one patch because I do rotate them from place to place every year. If you don't do that with tomatoes, it might result in bigger problems later down the line. Another thing I want to do is plant more trap crops which I already talked about a little bit um, when we were talking about squash vine borers. So a trap crop is planted something like three meters away from the plants that you want to protect. In the last couple of years, I noticed a lot of wasps around my house and it kind of like made me uneasy, but they weren't yellow jackets. Like they were different kinds of wasps. And I didn't realize at the time that there, I have been attracting parasitic wasps. So this year, I'm just going to thank them when I see them and say, thank you for being here. I'm not going to be seeing them as a nuisance anymore. And I might even put up a bee hotel for them. So yeah, I think it's really about using what I have that's on hand to combat these things. For the cutworms, I'm going to be using those toilet paper rolls. For slugs and other pests, I'm going to be crush up my eggshells that I've been saving up and putting them around the garden. I'm going to be using live mulches to help retain the soil and moisture and to hopefully contribute to a higher nutrient content. And that's the thing with weeds too. Um, a lot of people don't like having weeds in their garden, but weeds actually serve our purpose and they feed the soil. They're almost like a living fertilizer. So they contribute different things to the soil. Um, I think there is more information uh, about what weeds offer in Gaia's garden, but I don't know, I eat a lot of my weeds and I notice a lot of familiar ones in the garden. So dandelion, I will eat my dandelions. I will eat my garlic mustard, which are in the shadier areas of my garden. I eat my lamb's quarters, or at least I dehydrate it too. Wood sorrel is another one that I like eating. And my son goes around and he picks the wood sorrel and he eats it because it's sour and tangy. And it's actually really good for combating nausea as well. If you're ever feeling nauseous, just go into the yard and pick some wood sorrel. So there's a lot of great weeds growing that people just don't know about. So work with what you have. One last thing that I'm going to be doing that I haven't done too much of in previous years unless I'm direct sowing, but it is overplanting. I don't really overplant when it comes to transplants, but I think I will this year just because with the cutworms and the squirrels that like digging up my garden, I don't really give myself a chance when I just plant what I have. Like I never plant extra. And I think I'm going to be doing this that this year because I start my own seedlings. I usually have more than enough and I don't plant everything. I usually give my extras to my neighbors, but I think this year I'm going to be planting everything. I feel if I plant everything, I don't have to worry about my eggplant being dug up or my lettuce being mowed down 
by a hungry critter. If I overplant, I am inviting them to eat and I still have plenty left over and I'm not going to have to go out and buy more peppers because some of them didn't work out. But I think that's the one of the big advantages of starting your own seedlings because you, at least for me, I plant more than I need. When you go to the nursery and you buy your plants, you usually just buy what you need and you don't usually go out and buy more because that price adds up. If when you're paying $4 for a pepper plant or like $12 for a cherry tomato plant, it adds up quickly and you're a lot more reserved about what you are putting into your garden. Enough about that, we're going to get into the exciting part, at least exciting for me, about what I'm going to be planting this year. So you probably noticed this eyesore from the beginning, but I'm really happy it's here because it means the gardening season is right around the corner. This is an indoor greenhouse that I purchased last year. When it gets warm enough, I have everything on here and I start hardening my plants on this greenhouse. When they've been outside for a while, I start leaving them out at night and I'll just zip up like this thing comes down, but I just zip it down and I think it just keeps them a little bit warmer. I don't want them to get shocked too much, but I think this is a terrific thing. And then in the off season, it's in my basement and I just put all of my gardening supplies. Right now I have a lot of my gardening supplies in this big box. Uh, I have seedlings going here, which I already planted these in advance. It took me a while to make this video, actually. But here I have, well, you know what? You're just going to find out shortly what I have here. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I am in zone 5A. I have long, harsh winters that I need to deal with. And it starts getting warm enough to plant tomatoes and peppers at the beginning of June, like after May 2-4 weekend, which is Victoria Day weekend um, in Canada, or would be Memorial Day weekend if you're in the States. So that's usually when it's safe to plant. We have about four months of a good growing season here, excluding the cold weather crops like lettuces and peas, which I will be planting. Every year I buy new seeds because I'm a bit of a seed junkie. I've also been working on collecting seeds that I grow in my garden. One thing that I really want to be able to collect this year are tomatoes because one of the seeds that I bought this year are San Marzano tomatoes, which is like a plum tomato. And my husband's very excited. He just, he saw the seed and he's like, we need to plant all San Marzano tomatoes. And I don't know if I want to put all of my eggs in one basket, but I'm definitely going to be planting a bunch in addition to my regular plum tomatoes, which I love for making pizza sauce and just the different tomato sauces that I make. Last year, I think I had 12 tomato plants. Tomatoes are a big crop for me because I use them. I can them. Um, in the summer, there's nothing better than a tomato basil salad with fresh mozzarella and balsamic vinegar. Like, I am in heaven with that dish. Oh, so good. But I also can a lot of tomatoes. I can ketchup. I can pizza sauce. I can... What's the other thing? Diced tomatoes. I can diced tomatoes. I do like adding different tomatoes to my crop. So last year I did six plum tomatoes because they're um, they're meatier, they're not as watery, so they're really good for ketchups and pizza sauce, for example, for sauces. Uh, and then I did beefsteak tomatoes, which I like better for diced tomatoes and for just using all-purpose tomatoes. And then I had dark tiger tomatoes, which were black tomatoes. So they're fun and funky, but my plants did not do super well last year probably because of mineral deficiencies. And um, in previous years, I've experimented with rainbow tomatoes, but those also did terribly, the rainbow tomatoes. And one thing I noticed with my beef steaks is that I think also caused by nutritional uh, deficiencies, or maybe it's blight. I have to look into that more. But they, they like splitting or they grow really weird. But I have a great track record with the plum tomatoes. I'm going to show you the new seeds that I got for this year. These are from a Quebec company and they all the names are in French. So these are Comtes de Chambol beans. They're an ancient variety from 1880. So I'm very excited. Uh, I'm excited about these beans. Um, I decided that this year I'm not going to be planting any pole beans, which I've done in the last couple of years, just because I don't use them as much or I just don't, I see them and I forget them. And the only thing I know what to do with them is to make soup from them. So if you have a way that you like to eat pole beans, please let me know in the comments below because I really don't know what to do with them. I love the bush beans and I serve them all the time, but the pole beans, is there a special way to eat them? I know you're probably asking me that question, but I'm asking you that question because there's a lot that I don't know. I'm always learning. Okay, here I have Oregon 
Um, oh, these are sweet. These are sweet peas. Mange tout, so you can eat everything. That's something I decided I wanted to do last year. Last year, I sowed all kinds of peas. When I harvested them, I had a mixture of like shelling peas and a mixture of uh, sweet peas and snow peas. And I think this year I just want to stick with one variety and I want to make sure that variety is one that I don't have to shell. I think shelling peas are great, but they're not great mixed together. These are Cocozelle zucchini. So my husband's not the biggest fan of zucchini, at least not the green zucchini. I really like the yellow zucchini. He's not a huge fan, but I don't know where my yellow zucchini seeds are. Couldn't find them last year. I have these balls of zucchini and it look like small green pumpkins and they're great. They're really fun and my husband likes them. So I'll be planting these round zucchinis and these cocozels. Um, I'm going to see if I can find a picture and post it. This is Ven de Glace lettuce. Um, so Ice Queen lettuce uh, also originates from France. Okay, so those are the new seeds that I have that I'm very excited to grow this year. Other things I'll be growing are hot peppers, including jalapenos. Right here, I don't know if you can see it. I don't know if it's in the shot, um, but I have a Thai chili pepper plant that grew these amazing peppers. They're super spicy. I don't know what they are on the Scoville scale, but they were wonderfully spicy. And I ended up drying them and then I ground them and mixed them in with salt. And every morning I just sprinkle some of that salt in my eggs or if I want my soups to have a kick, I'll sprinkle a little bit of salt on that. And it's so good. But we fell in love with these peppers last year and Apparently, peppers do even better in the second year. So we dug up this plant. This is the first time we did it. So this is an experiment. So we dug up our plant and we're going to transplant it into the garden when it gets warm enough. Hopefully we'll have a bumper crop of these Thai chili peppers. Um, we'll see. Uh, it doesn't look too happy because this plant has been under attack. Um, thank you to my toddler. Other things I'll be planting are carrots. I'm going to be trying with cabbages again. I haven't had the best track record with cabbages in the last couple of years. Apparently, cabbages are supposed to be easy to grow. They're like the, they're one of the ideal victory garden plants, and I just struggle to grow it. Maybe it's the variety I've been growing. I can just read what I have on these containers in here. So I'll be growing beans. I have beets in here, but I don't think I'm going to grow them this year. I'm pretty good at growing them, but I think I grow them too close together. Not really good at thinning the beets out. And I think it's just easier to go to the farmer's market or, or to buy the beets when they're on sale. Because like last year, I got 10 pounds of beets for $5 and I just canned all of those. As opposed to take them, taking them out of the garden and having to wash everything. It's such a pain for me. Because, I mean, I have two small children and they are not interested in washing beets with me for more than five minutes. I mean, it was a great activity until they got bored of it. Oh, I'm going to be growing squash this year. So one thing my husband really wants me to grow are these autumn frost squashes that we bought one from the farmer's market um, in the fall. And it was almost like a whitish pumpkin-y looking squash. And it was delicious. So we saved the seeds and I'm going to try growing those for him. I'm going to be trying cucumbers again. Given the zone that I'm in, it's a little bit too late in the season for me to direct sow my cucumbers because by the time the cucumbers start to come in, it's already getting cold and then they're unhappy. Meanwhile, my next door neighbor is swimming in cucumbers. He has more cucumbers than he knows what to do with. So many, in fact, that they rot on the plants. So I think next year I'm going to volunteer to take his extra cucumbers because I hate seeing that kind of waste. There's so much I could do with his cucumbers. So I'm going to try sowing my cucumber plants indoors this year, a month in advance, and then transplant them. Normally, curcubits like cucumbers, they don't like being transplanted because their roots are pretty delicate, but... I mean, how many of you have gone to the store, bought cucumber and planted it and been fine? Like my neighbor does it every year. He's, he doesn't direct sow his cucumbers, but I do. He's the one who is swimming in cucumbers and I'm the one who has a paucity. Zucchini is one that I will direct sow. I have had no issues in the past with it coming up. And the only problem I have with my zucchini is the dreaded squash spine borer. Okay, and then carrots. I'll be growing carrots because my son loves going into the garden picking up a carrot and washing it off and he'll just walk around the garden and he'll crunch into a carrot and I love seeing that and it's exciting for him it's exciting for me to see him eat his vegetables and yeah so I'll definitely be growing carrots and there are so many funky varieties you can grow yes I'll be growing carrots oh and I like fermenting them too like they're a crop that I use unlike beets 
carrots are not that much of a hassle for me and it just provides a fun snack for my kittens. Here I have my herbs and they're not really listed on here. So I'll be growing dill this year because dill is good for attracting those parasitic wasps, especially when they flower. And I love dill. I haven't had much success with growing dill. I've tried sowing it for a couple of years now because uh, dill is another one of those plants that has delicate roots and they hate being moved around. But I have not had any luck growing dill. So I think I will be buying plants this year instead of trying to sow dill like a maniac. And I don't know, for me, it, they just don't do well indoors. So if you have any tips for growing dill, please let me know in the comments below because I don't know what I'm doing with dill. Probably just need to watch a video on YouTube. Um, basil. I love basil. It makes a fantastic companion plant for tomatoes. I have so much dill in the summer. I use it for everything. I just love how it smells. You can, even when it flowers, you can use it for a bouquet. And when you let these things flower, you can also collect basil seeds at the end of the season so that you don't have to buy more. So I have several varieties of basil in here, and I think I really want to get Thai basil this year. Um, so those are my herbs for greens. I don't know how, I'm going to be sowing lettuce this year, probably several different varieties. Kale, I'm on the fence. I think I might keep kale because I want to preserve it. Apparently you can, uh, an easy way to preserve kale, you chop it up, you steam it, you lightly steam it, and then you can season it. And then you put it in the freezer in like little pucks. And I think it's like half cup serving. So whenever you want to make a soup, you just grab one of these seasoned pucks of kale and you throw it in your soup. Um, so I think I might experiment with that this year. Um, I don't know. I've really took a big step back away from grains in the last year or two. So I haven't been growing them as zealously. But I really do love a beautiful, tender, crisp lettuce. There's nothing like a fresh lettuce from the garden. And I have my list here. So I'm just going to read my list here of what else I'm growing that I missed. I can be growing coriander and radishes and calendula. And I do want to add to my medicinal bed this year as well. So I have yarrow that is thriving in there. Last year, I tried getting chamomile in there. And then there was a bed with St. John's wort that we had transplanted from other areas of our property, but it never really took. It really just likes being wild on the lawn. So when my husband mows the grass, he just like veers around my patches of St. John's wort that are everywhere. And I'd like to talk more about my apothecary garden, but I have a whole video that's dedicated to that that is coming out in the next week or two. So stay tuned for that. So that's what I'm going to be growing in my garden. I'm sorry if that was a bit winded, but once I start talking about seeds, it's hard for me to stop. But now we are going to get into starting seedlings. So I mentioned already that I have herbs that I started here. So it's kind of hard for you to see, but you don't need a whole lot for starting seeds. The first year you do it, it might get a little bit pricey because um, of the infrastructure that you might need. You might not even need it. But a couple of things that I like to have for my tomatoes and peppers, like my warm crops, I like having a heating mat that I use to help keep everything warm. So I have the heating mat. I have a couple of lights that I use to, you know, once they sprout, you need to give them light. And I don't have the best setup. Ideally, I would just move this in front of a bright sunny window, but that's not always an option for me. And at the very beginning, the plants need a lot of light. I just have a couple of lights to help me out with that. If you have sunny windows, please take full advantage of them. I have one sunny window. It's in the living room and there's like a coffee table in front of it. And my seedlings are also at risk of my toddler because He's still learning the word no. Actually, he knows the word no because he says no to everything that I ask. <laughs> so a couple of things when you're starting seeds, you want the light, the heat mat comes in handy, and you'll want something to plant them in. So here we have these peat pots, which I'll be showing you soon. There are these little pucks and you get them wet and they, they grow and then you kind of separate them and then you plant your seeds in them. And they are great, but then if you're not going to be planting the seedling right away, you're going to have to transplant them because there's just not enough room for them to grow, like the roots split out of them. Um, and when I do plant them, I like removing the film off of the plant because I, I find that it decomposes very slowly. And speaking of something that decomposes very slowly, these little pots. They advertise these pots as decomposing pretty quickly, and if you plant your 
seedling into the garden with this pot on they have no room to grow because this thing is not going to decompose right away in the growing season at least that you're growing in and it's just you're basically going to stifle your plant because they're going to have nowhere to put their roots and they're going to be miserable and they're going to die so you can start your seedlings in here but when you transplant them take them out of the pot please i have whenever i buy plants I save these things and then I wash when I grow, but they are pretty fragile, so sometimes they crack and then I acquiesce and I recycle them. I have these mushroom containers that I like saving. I think I'll be probably starting my cucumber plants in here. I save these yogurt containers and I put potting soil in here and I'm going to be planting tomatoes and peppers in here since I grow those seedlings for a couple of months before I transplant them. And I just had my husband drill holes in the bottom of these. Like, um, I don't have it here, but a uh, black tray or some, uh, some kind of tray that collects water is something you want to have. So they have all kinds of things like that at your garden store or even the dollar store. The dollar store has so much. I just wouldn't buy seeds from the dollar store. Oh yes. And then when you are starting your seeds, when you first started out, you want to keep them covered until at least half of your tray is germinated. And that's when you're going to remove either a layer of saran wrap or a dome. So this thing here that I've been showing you, it has a dome and you can buy like this black thingy, like they sell kits that have the base and the dome. And it just makes everything really easy. Now it is time to start some seedlings. I already soaked these peat pots and fluffed them up. And now I am going to be planting some herbs because it is February when I'm filming this and that's what I need right now. So I'm just doing a few because I don't need more than what I currently have. So here I am planting sea parsley, but it's called Scotch Lovage. I am unfamiliar with this herb. Apparently it tastes like celery. These are seeds that were given to me by my mother-in-law. I've never planted lovage before. I've never had it in my garden. So we're going to see how this works out. This was my first time opening up that packet of seeds and I didn't know they were quite so large. Uh, I probably would have planted them in a different container had I known, but as they say, the show must go on and I am planting these seeds. Since these seeds are so large, I'm just pressing them down into the soil. And if they were smaller seeds, I would just probably leave them or cover them lightly with soil because some of the seeds I'll be planting are quite small. Next up is bee balm. And as you can see, these seeds are quite small. I tried starting bee balm last year and it didn't work out. And I don't know if it will work out this time because as of editing this video, nothing has germinated yet. I don't have any sprouts, but bee balm, it's also known as wild bergamot. It is in the mint family. It tastes a little bit citrusy, a little bit minty, and it's sometimes used as a flavoring in foods. It's a wonderful herb with many medicinal properties, so I really hope it works out. The next herb you are probably familiar with, I am starting some rosemary seedlings. I have been able to successfully do this for the last couple of years, so I'm not worried here. Although those also haven't germinated, so maybe there's hope for my bee balm. I grow these seedlings every year because whenever I take my rosemary in for the winter, since it does not do well in zone 5a through for the winter months, uh, I always kill it when I bring it inside. So I'm hoping maybe this year is the year I <laughs> figure out how to take care of rosemary during the winter months. Anyhow, it's easy to start the seedlings. As for my actual garden plan i don't have anything planned for this year yet i still want to figure out the best companion plants to plant with everything and like i said in previous years i have done rows so i'll have like my onions in one part of the garden and i'll have peppers and then i'll have like a row of i'll have my cabbages in one place but this year i'm probably gonna have cabbage and like a bunch of marigolds or i might even try the three sisters because that's a perfect example of permaculture gardening because you have the peas that are feeding nitrogen to the soil. You have the squash that is serving as a living mulch, like a ground cover. And then you have the corn, which adds as, which serves as a stock for everything to climb up, but it also needs nutrients. It needs a lot of nutrients, which is what the peas provide. So yeah, I'm still designing the actual garden, but I am planning for it and I'm I maybe at one point I will share what that garden is going to be looking like. I will 
absolutely to a victory garden tour this year i did one i think it was in 2020 it was the last time i did a victory garden tour and i did have people asking if i was going to be doing another one i really wanted to do another one last year but it was just too hard um with my family life but this year is definitely happening one thing i know for certain is that this growing season will come up with a new set of lessons for me to learn and every year it just strengthens me as a garden. And that's why I love encouraging everyone to start a victory garden. So if you don't have a garden yet, start a garden this year. You don't have to have a backyard to start a victory garden. As long as you have a sunny windowsill, have a planter and start growing some herbs. Or if you have a balcony, have a couple of pots. There are so many different ideas for small space gardens. Even if you don't have the space in your home, you might be able to join a community garden there everywhere. You might be able to start an initiative at work, see if they can install a bed. If you are a brand new gardener, you might want to check out my video where I share my own beginner tips. And if you are a seasoned victory gardener, I do have a victory garden playlist that you might want to check out next. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'll see you next time. Bye. For the cutworms, I'm going to be using those toilet paper worm worms. <laughs> for the...